So Bishop Peter, I suppose the first obvious question is how you're feeling uh, post-treatment or during, still ongoing? I'm feeling much better than I thought I would. I mean, the, the effects of three significant doses of chemotherapy, and I was in hospital each time for four or five weeks. I mean, left me completely sort of flat and lack of energy, uh, just sleeping all day. Um, and, and some days when I was in hospital, I couldn't get out of bed. So, so to be up and walking and enjoying the countryside and, and being able to think clearly. The other thing I noticed was that when I was on uh, lots of medication, um, that, that somehow I just couldn't focus and think. And so it's, it's nice that I feel I'm, I'm well. And, uh, and you're still going back to hospital, you're still undergoing some treatment. I, I was in hospital uh, in Taunton today, I was in Bristol yesterday, um, and they, they gave me good news, which is they said today that uh, I was in remission. I said, well, um, can you tell me what remission means? And they said, well, it means that when we look at your bloods, when we look at your bone marrow, um, we can find no trace of leukaemia. Now that doesn't mean that it's gone and gone forever, but they're saying, uh, at least clinically, that there's no evident sign of leukaemia. So, so which truly, uh, I think, both COD and the NHS, because uh, it does look like that they've managed to, um, to deal with it and, and it's responded well to the treatment I've received. So. And in your farewell speech from Archbishop Justin at Synod, he talked about the sort of dark year you've been through. And is that, that a good description of it? Has it been a yeah, it, moment of hope, clearly? Been, it's not been that, that dark. I mean, there have been times when it's been harrowing. Uh, and there are days when you're lying in bed, um, unable to think properly or to, to do very much. Um, and I spent weeks just in a room with no visitors. So the only staff I saw were the, the NHS staff, who were not only incredibly professional, but they were, they were so kind. But uh, the days weren't dark, and um, for that I I'm grateful. Um, I think the prayers of people, the encouragement, the support, was quite overwhelming and humbling. Mm. What did you think was the one thing that sustained you? You obviously had Jane, but who wasn't able to visit you very often, was she? What no, for you? several weeks she wasn't allowed to, to, to come at all. Nobody was allowed to come. Um, and I wasn't allowed to leave the room or even open the window because they were very worried about infections. I, I think it was just knowing that, that people were cheering me on and praying for me and encouraging me. And I, I received cards and emails from, from people, some of whom I hadn't seen for 30, 40 years, people I was at school with, people who'd been in the youth group. Um, years and years ago, either when I was a member of a youth group or when Jane and I were leading youth groups. They, they, they came and, and every day there was something. So, uh, so I've, that, that, that sustained me, I'm sure. If, if I'd been on my own mm. and, and got introspective, then it, it would have been tough. I was looking forward to coming back to the palace, coming back to Wells, but looking forward to seeing grandchildren. Two grandchildren were born during lockdown and I hadn't seen them. I uh, hadn't seen any of the family for the best part of a year. And, and that, that sustained me. I was determined to get well, to get better, and to see the family again, and to see to be with Jane. So. It, was, it was during that period where you had to also make a decision about your future ministry, wasn't it? And, and did, did that prey on your mind a lot, or, um, your future as a Bishop of Barton Mills, and when might be the right time to retire? Now, I spoke to my colleagues beforehand uh, and said, look, I'm not going to, to, to make any decisions. But, I'm just going to get, the aim is to get better, put all my energy into that, and then when I've had the stem cell transplant and I'm recovering, then I should need to give thought to it. And, and there was a day when my consultant came in and gave me a, a sick note, I've never, never had a sick note, I don't ever, I've never seen a sick note in my life, and she said, you're, you're unfit to work for six months. Um, and we talked about it, and she said, most people who have this treatment don't get back to work for nine months or for 12 months uh, and she said lots of people will never get back to work uh, after the processes and the treatment that you've had so I think that was the moment when I, I knew that I, I couldn't just sit around for six months or 12 months and hope I would get better because I think the reality is that I would never be well enough to do the job properly and fully and completely again um, so that made the decision much easier it must have been a a moment of great sort of sadness as well. I thought, you know, you all you've put in over the last seven years was it? Was it a really yes. difficult decision to make? Or? Um, I, mean, I think the decision was clear. I think uh, I've got no regrets. I, I've, I've had, been ordained forty-one years. Um, lots of wonderful, wonderful, wonderful times and privileges in those years. But I think um, there was lots. I had, as my energy came back, there were lots of things I wanted to do. 
people I wanted to see, um, visits I wanted to make, uh, there were lots of things I wanted to put into place. And then recognising that partly because of COVID, uh, but partly because of my illness and my need to continue to shield, that actually I, I wouldn't be able to do what I wanted to do. That even if my energy and enthusiasm came back, which it has, that I couldn't do the job properly. Um, so there's, there's, yeah, there's a regret. Um, but that's overwhelmed by Thanksgiving for, mm. for everything else. One, one thing I hadn't realised until fairly recently was you'd worked for a bishop who had the same I had I absolutely adored had. the Bishop of Portsmouth. And he was ill over a sustained period. Sadly, his leukaemia came back. He had a second mm -hmm. stem cell bone marrow transplant. Um, and he was ill for a very protracted mm -hmm. um, period. Um, and I was the senior archdeacon in the diocese, so I was leading the diocese through that time. And I also knew what it would mean for my colleagues. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, Bishop Ruth has done an outstanding, absolutely outstanding job in, in acting diocesan bishop, leading the diocese forward, bringing people together, making sure that we're responding to the, the challenges the churches are facing. Um, and I've done that. It, um, in Portsmouth Diocese before, so I, I knew the impact on my colleagues as well, and, and that was also a factor, that it, it, as well as it being right probably for Jane and for me and the family, it was also right for the Diocese and for Bishop Ruth that, that I should step down to give her that freedom to take things forward, um, because there's so much happening and so much that we need to be doing as a Diocese and want to do. Mm. Um, I didn't want my illness to be a, an anchor and a break. So, um, mm. It, it was the right decision, I'm sh absolutely sure of that. So looking back on your seven years here, what, what, what are the things that stand out for you in the diocese? It's a difficult question because for me every day it was a delight. So wherever I was going, whatever I was doing, it was just delightful. I suppose in terms of the highlights, there are the, the larger services, perhaps in Bath Abbey or in the cathedral, particularly if they're around a civic occasion, um, where people would gather for a particular purpose to pray or to celebrate or to um, commemorate something. But th those were, were big occasions. Um, there's also the candlelit carol services where the cathedral is mm. just completely full of people uh, and lit by the light of candles and where the music is, is glorious beyond words. So those big occasions are will always stick with me as highlights. Um, but you go from the, the big occasions with lots of people to the, the very personal. I remember a parish priest ringing me up and saying, would I come out and confirm uh, a lady? She had cancer. Um, she didn't have long to live, but wanted to be confirmed. Uh, and I went to her home and her sister was there and the parish priest was there. And just that privilege of sitting in someone's home and uh, hearing them talk about their faith, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that they were close to death themselves and yet being able to put their lives into God's hands and to confirm them. So it, it isn't just the big occasions, it's those very personal encounters that, that you, you never ever forget, I think. Mm. Mm. Um, and I, I've, we've got 180 plus church schools. Absolute delight to, to join a school and the, the, the children would show me around and they'd show me their work and they were so enthusiastic. I mean, you couldn't leave without being encouraged. And, um, so, uh, um, the visits to schools will be highlights. I think you said didn't you, that you feel you're leading the diocese in good heart. And in good hands. And in good hands. Yes, yes. both of those. Yeah, but it's, it's a challenge, I mean, it's always a challenging time for the Church of England, but it's particularly challenging that comes out of Covid and finances, etc. What, what are your hopes for the Church in Somerset? We need to be thinking what it is to be a much more welcoming, inclusive Church but also what does it mean to be much more outward moving and outward facing. Well, that was the word I took to all the deaneries when I arrived, is that I thought the church, when I came, was a little bit stuck, um, and we were perhaps more concerned with our own affairs rather than what was going on in our communities. Uh, and one of the effects and challenges of COVID is we've had to think about our communities and our neighbours uh, and, and those families for whom this has been an extremely difficult time. Uh, and we've seen that through food banks, through neighbourliness, for all sorts of things. And I think we've also had to think about how do we include people who don't necessarily come to our church buildings. Uh, and we've done a, an amazing job with online worship. And one of the challenges is how do we continue to have a, a presence in people's lives and homes 
in a way that we have managed through COVID. But what do we do when our buildings are open and perhaps the coronavirus is less evident? So there's some big challenges in the short term facing the viruses. Uh, and finance is yeah, one of them, of course. And obviously in the last seven years you haven't just looked after this diocese, you were responsible for safeguarding for the whole church and the lead bishop and safeguarding. And Archbishop Justin talked about a little bit about immense work and poss quite possibly the toll that that put on you. Um, what did you take away from your time doing that? You've talked about the need to be outward facing and that's certainly one of the areas where you did reorient the church's um, work on safeguarding. Um. I mean, there's lots of work in terms of processes and getting things through synod and getting the church to think about its culture and, and, and how things needed to change. And then it needed to change urgently and quickly and seriously. Um, and it needed to put resources into a, an area that had been under-resourced. But, but I think the main impact for me was the, the generosity of the survivors and the victims that I met. That I met. Um, people would contact me just out of the blue. Um, some of them were people I, I, I knew about. Uh, many weren't, uh, and um, when I said, well, can I come and see you, uh, people were very, very uh, willing to to welcome me. Um, they were very gracious, and uh, I think a lot of them have been so badly hurt and let down by the church uh, and have been abused within the life of the church. For them to be able to tell their story to a bishop, um, I think, I hope and think, made a huge difference. And. When I've been ill, um, a number of people who um, were very seriously and terribly abused uh, within the life of the church wrote to me when I was in my hospital bed and said, "Look, you know, thinking of you, do get better." And and that was that was very touching. And and several of them, it, since I've come back um, home here and to Wales, have said, "Look, um, I know it's going to be difficult, but please can we keep in touch?" It's very hard, isn't it, to think of. I mean, the church is changing and probably changing too slowly, you would say, in that regard, would you? But, um, and it's sort of hard to acknowledge progress in an area like that, isn't it? But there has been some progress um, through your time there. There has. I mean, it, it's uh, um, were very clear, very focused, very helpful, uh, as well as being very challenging in their recommendations. Uh, and we looked at those, not only was, did we accept them, and it was right to accept them, um, their recommendations and their insights were extraordinarily helpful, a real gift to the church. Uh, and we wrote a, a, a business plan, an action plan, as to how we're going to take them forward. And I would have been very cross if I hadn't seen evidence of, of movement and resourcing that, to deal with those recommendations and to, to change things. And I think that the important thing is that the, the General Synod have recognised their responsibility. This isn't just down to parish priests, it isn't just down to safeguarding officers. This is the responsibility of the whole of the church. So I think there have been some fundamental changes. But as you said in the question, we've got a long way to go and we're still moving slowly. And we've got to pick up speed with those things and make sure they're properly implemented and done well. Because we need to win back the confidence of people who have lost confidence in the church. And we need to be able to honour those very brave people who've come forward and have talked about their own experiences and those who went to ITSA and, and told their stories at huge, huge personal cost. As people have disclosed and relived their experiences, it's been a re-traumatising of, of life for them. Um, and we owe it to them to make sure that the work that they've done and the honesty and the courage they've shown is being translated into, into a church that is safe and is welcoming and inclusive and where, where these things we pray, hope and trust could not happen again. And the way you talk about it, which Peter, I think it's probably had, it must have had a really profound effect on you those years doing safeguarding and meeting the survivors and set aside. Do you think that really did reshape your ministry in some way? Yes, I th think it did. Um, you have to sit in silence really. In, in, as you do if someone's been bereaved, but, but there was, a, there was a, an intensity of, of uh, emotion uh, and extraordinary trust that some people have been abused by bishops or by clergy uh, and being prepared to meet with me. Sometimes we met in public places um, or people invited me to a safe place um, or people invited me to their home and, and an enormous amount of trust 
Um, because if those conversations had gone badly, then I would have been adding to their hurt and their anger. I don't think I felt at any point the need to defend that which was indefensible. I, I didn't. I, 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 I offered my apologies, which I offered sincerely. Um, but I set out knowing that the, the church had failed and failed people, not just badly, but in cases, some cases, disastrously. And so I think that was my starting point. Um, and I think people recognized that I genuinely wanted to help them and to find ways to, to, to improve, to better their lives. You, you, what had happened couldn't be undone. Mm -hmm. What had happened couldn't be changed but one could make the future better, um, even if the, the, the past was always going to be absolutely appalling. Mm. Okay. And the sense that, that again, that, 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 that God was going with me, that I wasn't just doing this as mm. Peter Hancock or as the Bishop of Arthur Wells or as the lead bishop on safeguarding. I, I was going in God's name to share God's love and to where appropriate to pray with people and to listen to them and knowing that, that, that before I arrived God was going to be at work and that actually he was going to do some something it might have been a bring people some peace or some healing or some uh, a sense of forgiveness or a sense of um, hope um, I, I didn't know what God was going to do but I was confident that, that when I was on the train coming home he would have done something. And I'm pleased that there are now three safeguarding bishops and rather than just one because I think I think it was a heavy load for one person to carry. What strikes me about you is you're always, despite what you've gone through in the last 18 months, you feel somebody very full of joy and love and whatever you encounter. And I wondered, your faith is the, is the source of that, is it? It is. And, and alongside that, the, the love and the prayers of, of family and friends and uh, and others who are outside the church uh, would still write and say, look, supporting you. But I, but I do think that people's prayers was, was not only uplifting but, but, um, and encouraging, but I think it sustained me through, um, through what I, the, the months I've been through. Because you're quite cut off and isolated and separated, so, so those emails and cards and phone messages and WhatsApps were, were really just delightful. Um, so that, that, but... Um, and I found the scriptures came alive. There were parts of the Bible that um, stood out in the way they hadn't. Um, and just being able to say morning or evening prayer on days when I was well enough to. And to know that parishes across the diocese, across the country, across the world, were, were all praying these same prayers. It was very sustaining that, although I had, perhaps hadn't seen anybody in my room for two or three hours, that actually I was not alone. I mean, not only was the Lord there, um, but I was part of the family of God, the people of God, right across the world. So it was, it was knowing that my faith was shared alongside the faith of so many others. Mm -hmm. How Jane describe you? I, I think she would say that, it, that, um, that I'm always very positive. That means that sometimes you're not always realistic about, you know, I always had thought I could achieve more in a day than I could. And I'm someone who looks forward rather than back, so. Um, you feel changed by it then? I am. I mean, I think um, when you're lying on a hospital bed on your own, there's an opportunity to reflect on things. And I think I was over busy, um, over enthusiastic, and over energetic, really. And, and I think actually to, to calm down, slow down, um, and, and to be able to look God in the eye and listen to His voice was was something that I hadn't done enough of. So a chance to read and reflect and, and think. And so I think that's made me more more reflective and therefore I hope more responsive to the needs of others, that, that I'm not just rushing around from one thing to the next, that I've got time to, to think about what I'm doing and what priorities should be. And, uh, and that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Is that something you'll take into retirement? Think about, I mean, I hope, I, I hope and expect to have a a busy retirement. I don't know what I should be doing, but I, I can't quite see me just sort of sitting on a garden bench <laughs> in the sun. Well, I'm not allowed to sit in the sun because of um, secondary cancers and things. So, I, um, I, you know, I can't see myself lying under an umbrella all day. Thank but you. things have a habit of coming and finding you, I think. So, um, 
Is Jane glad you're retiring? I think she is. Um, we've had such a huge amount of fun, and actually we've had quite a shared ministry, which has been been lovely. She's been the most wonderful support. I remember um, looking out of the window in Bristol, um, and and she she was quite a long way away, uh, walking down the road, and she stopped just to wave goodbye. I remember just breaking down into tears. I realised just how much I loved her. Um, the last question, probably. Looking forward to, we talked about the challenges of the Church of England and all dioceses. Um, I suppose I wonder how much faith you have it's going to weather all those challenges. There's obviously always bad press about declining numbers and the church didn't act during a, was invisible during COVID, etc. How much faith do you have that the church will emerge? I mean, it, it just, will emerge? Yeah, we, we have to make changes, you know, changes will be forced on us. Some of those will be painful, many of those will be challenging. So in the short term, it's going to be a difficult time for the church, particularly as we are reaching out and, and there's so much we're trying to get involved in the life of the community in a way that I don't remember the church wanting to reach out into the big issues of the day uh, in quite the same way you know, for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, we've been slumbering a bit uh, and the days for, for sleeping and slumbering are gone. Uh, and I think we will continue to see um, numerical decline for a, for a while but the church is based on the resurrection it, it, it's not it's based on God it's based on the love of God um, the first bishop who came here came in 909 it, you know, it survived a thousand years in Bath and Wells uh, and when people say oh the church has had its day I, I don't believe that for one moment because it's the church of the living God it's the church of Jesus Christ uh, risen from the dead we're still in the Easter season and um, so in the longer term, I'm confident that the church may be different, um, but it's going to be just as active and, um, and relevant to the lives of people. And I'm, I'm encouraged in this diocese by uh, the, the young people who come forward to be confirmed by all that's going on in our church schools. Um, it's extraordinary what's happening with our chaplaincies. Um, we've got, as you would know, you know, now hundreds of people who are in different places and different ways are, acting as chaplains and um, that's that's something which God has given um, and people are hearing a calling to that uh, and then of course there's our pioneer ministry people who are beginning to to, to hear a call uh, not to work within the church but to work from the church in the world uh, and those are those are really exciting things for the future uh, and, and they're gaining momentum I and mean, so all of those are getting stronger and they're more effective so I'm, I'm very confident but for the last of Bath and Wells, but, but there's, there's, it, it'll, there are people who are faithful, prayerful, dedicated, committed, um, and it's on on that basis that the church will continue to grow. It isn't necessarily about strategies or visions or finances or buildings or resources. It's the people of God being the people of God, living and telling the story of Jesus, and that's that, and that, that there's more evidence that people are finding a joy in their faith. So I'm, I'm, I'm very confident.